Okay, so Burlington Wine Club. Assuming everybody's here in the right place? I think so. Okay. Um, so for anybody that's new, um, I'm the club sommelier. Uh, I'm Teresa. And um, just a little bit of housekeeping. We are recording this, this session, but if you don't want to be recorded, you can turn off your video and then you won't be seen. And we just started recording now. We don't record during the um, chatting or socialization. Um, if you have any questions as we're going through this, uh, use the chat feature and just type your question and we'll be monitoring it. And every so often we'll stop and we'll answer the questions. Um, your co-host tonight who will be looking at the, uh, the questions and helping me in every which way is Marilyn. Um, so if you have any issues or anything, you can always just type Marilyn and she will uh, do her best to deal with it. Um, the other thing is there are two different modes. There's a speaker mode and a gallery mode and they're very different views, okay? So while the speakers are speaking, when Tom's speaking and Michael, you may wanna be on speaker mode um, because then they'll be featured. Um, but if at any point you want to be on gallery mode, then you'll see everybody. So a couple of things. We have one brand new member who's just joined us. And I think it's absolutely fantastic that during the vi virtual sessions, during the pandemic, that we actually have a new member. So Paula, welcome. We're so glad you have joined us. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, so it's lovely to have you. Um, Vanessa, it's her birthday tonight. So happy birthday, Vanessa. And I'm absolutely delighted that you chose to send your, spend your birthday with us tonight. <laughs> Thank you. Love you. <laughs> so it's lovely. Um, and of course, Heather, I didn't realize that it was your birthday coming up as well. So happy birthday to you. Um, recent events. Okay, so last month we had Univin and Spirits, Darlene Emberly, and she um, has been here before and I think presented some lovely wines. Um, and then, of course, March 13th, we had a St. Patrick's virtual dinner with Chef Mike. Um, and I think most of you were at that dinner. Um, and I have to say, the soda bread, I'm still thinking about that soda bread anyway, as well as the rest of the dinner. So it was great to have Chef Mike do that. Coming up over the next little while, April 10th, we have the Spring Fling with Chef Maggie. And if you haven't seen the menu, it looks awesome. Um, and that's, you know, that's a Saturday night dinner again. May 28th will be interesting um, because Carlo Estates is coming out and all of their wines are vegan. And we're gonna be doing a gourmet plant-based food kit um, to complement those wines. And actually at the end of April, um, I just got confirmation tonight um, that we have uh, Nancy, who used to be from uh, Hobbs and Company, and is now with a different agency, she's gonna be coming out at the end of April. So I'll be announcing that or putting that up on the website pretty soon, like over the next couple of days, and you can register for that. And then the third item, the third thing we have booked is tacos and tequila, again with Chef Mike, and this is going to be our first live event. So it's gonna be in my backyard, which um, most of you have seen, by now and you know that um, it's uh, a reasonable size and I have tables all over the place um, so we can stay safely distanced and it's going to be limited to 20 people because we can have a total of 25 so if we take Chef Mike and um, Marilyn and Dave and me and uh, Lola to, to help us pour some of the tequilas we have room for 20 people. And what I'm going to do is for those of you that have been attending the virtual sessions, um, you will have first option to attend this live meeting. So you'll get like 48 hours to register before it goes out to anybody else. 
Okay, so it's May 16th. It's a Sunday afternoon. And it's deliberately a Sunday afternoon because I'm hoping the weather will be nice and it won't be dark and we'll be able to have uh, an event in the backyard. If it is a bit chilly, um, we do have heaters and we also have uh, tents and canopies. Um, so, and we've had, we've had events in the middle of February. So I'm quite sure we're gonna be able to manage an event uh, mid-May. So anyway, think about that. You'll be given a short period of notice, like 48 hours to sign up before anybody else has an opportunity to. And that's really um, our way of saying, thank you so much for supporting us uh, when we had to go virtual and we couldn't have live events anymore. And uh, you, you folks have been like awesome. So first live event, you have first dibs. And then tonight, of course, we have Michael German back again, um, Trajectory uh, Beverages, and we have a generous supply of wines in the kits, and then a number of other wines um, available um, that most of you have some or all of. Okay, without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Michael, and also, you most of you have already met uh, Tom, Thomas Green, the VP of Winemaking and Operations. Um, so, Michael, how about I turn it over to you? Yeah, and thank you guys. You and Tom, and, and talk about the wines, and I'll be quiet for a few moments. <laughs> Thanks for having us back again, guys. I know it's been, I think this is our third tasting together. So, um, out of all these products here, I'll be talking about our import varietals, our, our, sorry, our import brands, and then... Uh, Tom is going to be speaking to all of our VQA brands, all of which he made personally. Uh, so if you have any questions about the winery, the region, varietals, winemaking techniques, where Tom buys his cologne, I don't know. Feel free to go ahead and ask him that stuff, guys. Um, as you can see on the tasting night, the first wine that we do have is our Cielo Pinot Grigio. So we've done something with the Prosecco in the past. Uh, this is from the same Cielo family. Uh, so it's a hundred percent. Michael, can I interrupt for a second? And this oh, sure. is this is my bad. We've missed a wine, and that is, and for some reason I don't have the correct. Spike. We have our sparkling. Is the, the sparkling Moscato, and traditionally we always do a cheers. Mr. So Tom maybe Green, you can lead us Feel in free. that and and talk about um, the sparkling Moscato first. Yeah, I'm going to have uh, Mr. Tom Green enter the chat and speak to you about the sparkling Moscato, and uh, we'll do a cheers, then we can hop into the Pinot Grigio afterwards. Perfect. Okay. Uh, thanks, everybody. Thanks for allowing me to uh, join your session here tonight. Um, I'm going to ask Mike to uh, just take over for two minutes while I run to my fridge and get the sparkling Moscato so I can open it in front of you guys and then talk about the wine because uh, obviously I showed up here at uh, home um, just at about six o'clock and just had about an hour to chill all these wines um, and I'd like to taste them with you as we're doing it. So if you can give, give me two minutes, Mike, I'll just uh, ask you just to uh, reintroduce uh, trajectory to beverage partners and also time in the States and know what's going on. Of course. Yeah. For those of you that, uh, that joined a little bit later in the group, uh, we are Diamond Estates Wine and Spirits. Uh, so as Tom had quaintly put before, we are essentially a wine house. So we produce a bunch of 100% VQA wines that are produced at our Lakeview uh, wine cellars down in Niagara Lake. Uh, we're right off uh, Niagara Stone Road, just after Southbrook Winery. The massive, massive facility. It's the number one VQA producing facility in all of Niagara. Um, so if there's ever an opportunity for you guys to come on down and take a look at the winery, uh, if you want to do a tour and tasting, uh, please just reach out to us and we'll make sure that we get you guys on the tour and a tasting. Uh, even during these COVID times, they've done a really great job of taking uh, as many precautions as they can. Uh, everything they've done up to what the government requires of them. We do have, uh, I call them tasting pots. Uh, they look like little honeycomb factories out back that you can sit inside and collect your heaters, uh, taste a bunch of our wines uh, and even do a little bit of a tour. So one thing that we have uh, offered and reached out to you guys about as well is we would love to do a virtual tour of the winery with you at some point. Uh, so we can pre-record a little tour with Tom and myself going through the Lakeview Cellars facility. 
showing you how some of the brands specifically are produced stylistically and techniques, how they're a little bit different, uh, where the varietals come from. We can walk through the vineyard and show you the great bunches themselves, and then through the whole process as, uh, as Tom likes to do uh, through the facility. So if that sounds great to you guys, uh, pass the feedback on to Teresa. We can always do a little special session for you and pass it along with any information of the wines that we have um, available for sale through the Lakeview Cellars website. Excellent. That's great. Yeah, great. thanks, uh, Mike. <clears throat> yeah, you're back, Tom. Okay, there you go. All right. Yeah, no, thanks, guys. And Mike, thanks for taking it over there while I get the uh, the wines. I got actually all the import wines as well and also the uh, um, our, our wines we produce in Iron Lake. So uh, the first wine that we're going to be tasting today, and we're going to refresh and cheers as we go through, but let me just tell you a little bit about um, our uh, sparkling Moscato. So this is actually a little project that I uh, implemented um, about two years ago, and we've been producing sparkling wines for uh, over 10 years now, uh, both the traditional method and also in the oh, sorry, <laughs> let me close my door, that's my dog. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that, guys. COVID times. Ooh. COVID times, you know, they're probably seeing a bunny out there or something. But anyway, um, but uh, we've been producing uh, uh, sparkling wines, both in uh, traditional method and also in Charmat method uh, uh, for over 10 years. Um, but we have seen a lot of popularity in the nice aromatic sparkling wines over the last uh, couple of years. And, you know, we've... Some of the other sparkling wines we produce obviously is a sparkling Riesling, which is more, you know, I wouldn't say traditional, but it's, it's an aromatic varietal that we've been producing over for, for about 10 years now. Um, but the sparkling Moscato is something that um, uh, we've seen, we, we've experimented um, in, you know, you know, just regular Moscato uh, table wine um, uh, for about six years now. And we thought the aromatics on this wine is so amazing that you know we got to try this in a, in a sparkling format for an aromatic sparkling wine and two years ago we started this with our uh, fresh sparkling moscato um, it's in a charmette method although the primary fermentation th does everybody know how sparkling wine is made or the different ways sparkling wine, wine can be made can I ask that question absolutely but this group is probably pretty familiar with it but well okay so let me, the, the three, the, just in general terms the three and i like to see i'm going gallery view again because i like to see everybody's faces so um the really the three ways you can make sparkling wine traditional method like actually i'll start from the the lowest quality method that you can do it is basically like making soda pop like pop where you're taking a base wine and you're injecting it with co2 um, when it's really cold and that CO2 dissolves into the, the wine and you're basically making this very, you know, general poppy style uh, sparkling. And that's really what you, you got out of those baby ducks uh, uh, wines years ago. Actually, they're still probably being sold, um, but it, it's really the cheap man sparkling. <laughs> Uh, the second way to make sparkling wine, and I'll start from the opposite end of the spectrum, which is traditional method, where you're taking your base wine, you're re-inoculating it in the bottle, and this is where the traditional method comes in. We're using traditional varietals like Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, um, Pinot Meunier, and you're inoculating that again with yeast in the bottle with sugar, sealing the, the, the bottle, and um, letting the fermentation occur in the bottle. That's where the traditional method happens. Um, the yeast then obviously produce, you know, co convert the sugar into alcohol, but through that process, they produce CO2, carbon dioxide, and that's what makes all obviously the bubbles. And that's really the, you know, a rudimentary way of explaining traditional method sparkling wine uh, on how it's made. Uh, Charmat method or, um, uh, uh, Kluve close uh, is the terminology that's used where you're doing the same process where you're re-inoculating that base wine, but you're doing it in a, a, a pressurized tank. And then you're bottling those wines under pressure um, to produce a aromatic sparkling wine. Uh, typically the Charmat wines are not aged 
for a long period of time on the leaves, uh, on the yeast cells. And so you're not getting that buttery effect, which is not what you want out of aromatic sparklings, but under traditional sparklings like Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, you do want that buttery effect and uh, you know softening feel in the uh, in, in the sparkling wine. So with this wine, obviously a Moscato, it's a very powerful aromatic wine. It's not going to be done in the traditional method. We want it to be a nice, easy way to you know experience the aromatics and the sparkling effect. But the one way thing that's different about this is that we are not making a base. Moscato spark, uh, table wine first and then re-inoculating it. This is actually Moscato from harvest time that has gone through a primary fermentation in a pressurized vessel, a pressurized tank. And these bubbles are actually the, the primary fermentation, not the secondary fermentation. So Hopefully that kind of explains everybody it, it, where it's not a base wine going through a secondary fermentation. It's the primary fermentation that we've, we've captured all the CO2 that was generated during that fermentation. And uh, that's one of the reasons why we've tried to experiment with this, uh, this process. Um, this wine, uh, uh, actually the majority of the sparkling, this, this Moscato comes from our own property at Diamond Estates. Uh, we have you know, almost six acres of uh, Moscato on our property. And um, uh, the actual varietal is Moscato Autonel. All right. Um, uh, again, if you, has everybody gone through and done the sniff test and the uh, swirl test? But uh, Moscato tends to be very aromatic, very floral in character. Um, you can see the nice uh, tight sense of bubbles on it. And I just uh, like it won a double gold last year for our first year making it. We were super excited and happy about it. And I hope you guys uh, enjoy it as a cheers for your uh, first tasting. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers, everybody. And I will say that it's an off dry sparkling. It's not a dry sparkling. So everybody should know that. Yeah. Um, but it's not as sweet. It's not nearly as sweet as some of us might have been expecting just because no. it's Moscato. So that was lovely. Teresa, and you're absolutely right. Um, uh, one of the things that, uh, in Moscato is actually a very popular varietal in Ontario. Um, and one of the big you know, sellers is, um, I won't even state the winery, but it's actually out of California. And you know, the analysis of the sugar content on this uh, Moscato from, you know, uh, from California is, I don't even tell you, but it's ridiculous. It's almost like 60 grams per liter residual sugar. It's very, very sweet. And to me, to, honestly, to me, it's overpowering. One of the things that you'll taste in the wines tonight, especially from our winery, I can't speak for a lot of the other ones because I'll taste them with you, but there's three things that we really want to do as winemakers is to balance the wine. And when you're balancing a wine, you're trying to balance the alcohol content, the sugar content, the flavor profile, um, to make sure that you know not one of those characteristics is overpowering, and the acidity, not overpowering the other characteristic. And sometimes uh, some of these wines, you know, with this one wine from California, uh, Moscato is so sweet, I think it just takes away from all the other characters. Uh, Moscato can be a very delicate wine. It certainly, for me, is not going to be a dry wine, but you don't want the sweetness to overpower you know, all the other characters. So we try to balance that with the, uh, uh, with the, uh, you know, the, the aromatics and the flavor profile of the wine. So. Excellent. All right. Okay. Cheers, everybody. Fantastic. Thanks, Tom. Cheers. Um, I guess we're on to the Cello Pinot Grigio. Yes. Tell us about the Pinot Grigio. I think we've all tried the Prosecco or most of us tried, tried the Prosecco at a previous session before. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's the same producer. Um, the one thing I find really unique, if you do have the bottle in front of you and you can see it on the back, I know it's more and more popular, but this is a vegan uh, wine. Uh, they're really big into sustainable farming. Uh, so if there's any information that, or if that appeals to anybody, we're, we're kind of barking up the right tree here. Uh, this is a fourth generation family owned winery. Uh, it started in 1908 and that's communicated on a label. And the really, uh, it sounds so soft story, but uh, romantic part about this winery 
uh, is that the original estate overlooks uh, the two medieval castles uh, of the original Romeo and Juliet families, uh, which is like a really cool thing that, you know, sounds like somebody would just be creative and write on the back of a wine label. Um, but if you uh, want to go ahead and you can even take a look at the website later on, uh, they do have the original photos from the where the vineyard sits to how it overlooks uh, the region that it's from. Uh, the original uh, winemaker was the, the Nono, or the grandfather of family. His name was Giovanni. Like I said, it was a small estate in 1908. It is a DOC wine. It's a fourth generation family owned. And they all, and their their whole region now is uh, Monteroso Vincenzo. So it's a straw yellow, uh, green reflection, a lot of green apple on nose of this wine. Very fresh, uh, very, very drinkable. And it's some great acidity here. So if you haven't tried this wine already, please smell it, swirl it, smell it again, and sip it. Um, after you've tasted the wine, I would definitely encourage you to try the food and then try a little bit more wine afterwards. Yep, perfect, perfect intro to that, Michael. And in terms of the food, so smacked cucumber salad with sumac pickled onions. So in a sense, I took a little bit of a chance with this because they're very distinct flavors, um, but the sumac kind of mellows the onions. Um, and I thought the Pinot Grigio had enough body and weight to go with this particular dish. And this dish is a Middle Eastern dish. Um, anyway, try it. So uh, as Michael said, have a sip of your wine, try a bite of your food, and then have a sip of the wine again. And if I've done the job right, or my team has done the job right, then when you have the second sip of your wine, it will taste even better than the first sip. I really agree with you there, Teresa. I think that, uh, I, I do think that has a creamier mouthfeel to this wine versus a more uh, acidic or uh, stringent uh, Pinot Grigio. Uh, and this is done in a classic Italian style. Uh, I'm a real big fan of this wine. Uh, it pairs very well with your pairing, by the way. Um, you'll get a little bit of lemon, honeydew, and some floral honey on this. Uh, finishes very, very nice uh, on a warm day. Hopefully next week the weather cooperates with us. But if you're sitting outside, this is a great chilled bottle to open up and have one by yourself. And if you don't mind me, if Feel free to add Teresa. comments to the chat. If you like the pairing, if you don't, if you like the wine, if you have any questions, you know, send it to the chat. Uh, if I also try to interject here for a second, the, the one thing I'll also recommend is don't judge anything by your first sip, uh, especially when you're coming off uh, a, a, you know, a slightly sweeter sparkling wine. It's meant to cleanse the palate, but now your, your, your palate has a little bit of sweetness um, uh, uh, aftertaste to it, and it's, it, it's, it's expecting sweetness. Uh, so when you go back to the cello, which is our first wine that we're trying tonight, uh, it may taste a little drier than it's what, what, what it's meant to be. So um, I would recommend taking, you know, the first sip as a, a swirl and, and spit, so to speak, um, and then moving to, you know, your, your first tasting as, a, as the tasting. Absolutely. Good, good, good advice, Tom. Uh, Teresa, we've already received good feedback. Thank you, Beth and Martin. Salad is wonderfully fresh, and the wine makes it just that little bit more fantastic. And Lola, <laughs> Lola is uh, also chiming in. It's a great pairing. So thank you all for your efforts on that. Okay. And it's a nice Pinot Grigio. Yeah, just for the members so I know, it is. Uh, I, we've sent the information through, but it is uh, twelve forty nine uh, a bottle. Um, it's direct delivery, it's consignment wine, so this is not retail available. Um, they do come in cases of 12, and I know through Teresa's bottles, you're also able to get individual bottles if you didn't want to commit to a full case. Um, but I do love the fact that it's something unique and it's something different that we could bring to, to your club and your members and do as well as Awesome. Perfect. Uh, so, on to our second. Sauvignon Blanc. Yes. Uh, this... <laughs> I sometimes say things taste like California, like California Cab or Zinfandel or certain things, but this really just smells like New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc. Um, I think it's a fantastic wine. Uh, I definitely encourage you to smell this wine right now, swirl it, smell it again before I, I go into it a little bit further. Uh, 
I hope you've done that. Um, there's a lot. Sorry, on the sorry Mike. Ticket. Sorry, Mike. I, I, I don't mean to interject, but two seconds here. Go ahead. Um, obviously, because I'm very partial to Niagara and the wines we make. Uh, but I also have to have respect for the wines that we also represent and sell from around the world. And, and we do have some of the, the greatest wines uh, that we represent from, you know, Mount Riley and, and, and Cielo. Uh, but just so everybody knows, we also do make great Sauvignon Blancs and, and Pinot Grigios uh, in Niagara as well. So just, you know, look out for those as well. In or fact, and, and, and we've, had, um, we've had a number of Sauvignon Blancs. Um, from Niagara, I absolutely agree. Um, in fact, it's one of the, so Chardonnays and Sauvignon Blancs in particular, Niagara does very, very well. Um, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, this is 100% uh, Sauvignon Blanc, obviously, but it hasn't been blended with anything. And it's between the Waru Valley and the Ottawa Valley. Uh, it's stainless steel, 100%. It's crushed and destemmed prior to pressing. Uh, again, light straw, a little bit of a greenish hue to this wine. Uh, grapefruit, passion fruit, gooseberry on the nose. I had to taste this wine again before the tasting, actually, uh, to refresh myself with this, but it has a, a very long lingering finish to this wine. And there is a lot of acid, as you would expect with Sauvignon Blancs, and especially uh, out of a New Zealand region and, and, and Marlborough specifically. Uh, but I find with the weight of the wine, it doesn't come off super astringent. So it's got a great medium full mouthfeel to this um, crisp acid. And I think your pairing on this is, is very, very traditional. Yeah. So the scallops with orange and fennel. So hopefully everybody had a chance to reheat them. Um, but so the orange and the fennel, the orange for the acidity, um, fennel, the licorice, with this wine and um, I don't know, scallops, scallops and orange with the Sauvignon Blanc. I, I, you cannot go wrong with that pairing, Teresa. <laughs> um, again, for me, this, the, the aromatics on this wine, that could probably list another five or six. Um, they stand out so much. And even after I've tasted it, I can still feel um, the acidity and the mouthfeel This really, really lingers. And it's one of my favorite parts about these uh, New Zealand Sauvignon Blancs. Uh, and I hope everybody's really enjoying this one so far. Yeah, I, I will say from a Sauvignon Blanc standpoint, I think this is something that um, um, really, you know, Sauvignon Blancs really take to the terroir of any region. Um, many people are very thrilled about Sauvignon Blanc from New Zealand area. Um, it has very unique character. Again, back to the terroir. Um, it, I'm a huge fan of Sauvignon Blancs and I just love the powerful aromatics that are coming off this wine for sure. Um, definitely the gooseberry gets me for sure. Um, so uh, like I'm thoroughly enjoying this. Anybody else? Any comments in the chat room or in the chat, Marilyn? Uh, yes, the, the um... Diana, I'm just going to call you out. She went right to the beets and goat cheese. She, <laughs> I guess that's her favorite. So she skipped over the pairing, but she loves the recipe. Um, so, so thank you for that. Uh, fantastic. Um, and really, it's just great to have everybody together and ex experiencing uh, what you're offering, both from local Sauvignon Blanc and also from maybe what we consider offshore New Zealand traditional. So, so thank you for that, for sure. Yeah, of course. It was, I was very happy that we were able to come back and do this again. And uh, with us, like I guess Tom, Tom has alluded to being a wine house in Niagara, but also having an agency side where we represent a bunch of different consignment brands that we can bring in uh, internationally. I think it, for clubs like yours, which do such a great job at facilitating these tastings, it provides us a lot of versatility. Um, so I know we can do different themed events, but on, on ones like this, we're doing flights, whites and reds. Uh, it's fantastic to bring your products from all different wine regions and uh, and make sure that they're they're beautifully crafted and they get to you guys and you're able to sample them and purchase them if you like them. So, um, so one of the things, Teresa, we didn't do, um, it, it is our habit. If you get something in the wine kit that's in metal, that's a signal that it can be reheated. And we didn't give you reheating instructions. And I'll confess that I ate... <laughs> both my husband's and mine in, in just out of the package and they were still equally good 
room temperature, they didn't need to be reheated. But if you if you see something in metal in the kit, it's your signal that you should uh, think about reheating it. Yep. If it's in plastic, obviously not. <laughs> That's good to know. I didn't reheat mine. I just ate it. Same it was still, I did the same. It was still delicious. Yep. Just dove yeah. right in. <laughs> it was still delicious. <laughs> My, uh, my final note, I forgot to just mention to you guys, it is, it's 3.8 grams of residual sugar on the Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, so this, we do have a, a very dry style Sauvignon Blanc here. And uh, not for your club members specifically, uh, but I would say for more of an entry level wine drinker, if you have friends or family over at your house, this is definitely a wine that if they're looking for something sweet, they're not necessarily always looking for residual sugar, but it's really that fruit concentration and aromatics. So using Rieslings and Sauvignon Blancs of this nature that are highly aromatic, have that acid and a little bit more body are generally fantastic crowd pleasers. Excellent. Tom, I'm going to okay. pass over our, uh, our two Lakeview and Eastel uh, Rosé over to you. Okay, thank you very much. I hope, uh, hope we're not rushing everybody on sampling these wines, or maybe some of you have already sampled past the, uh, you know, the list. Um, but, I think our uh, timing is probably pretty good, Tom, because <laughs> this is our third wine and we have three more to go. So we're, okay. we're good. All right. Um, the one thing I just wanted to make note of as we go through this tasting is that uh, all of our wines are also vegan friendly. Uh, there are no animal uh, derivatives or additives to any of our wines. So just so that everybody is aware of that as well. And Tom, since yes. you mentioned that they're vegan, Maybe, um, so we're going to talk about it when we do our vegan wines and plant-based, but since you've mentioned it, maybe explain why wines might not be vegan. <clears throat> okay, yeah, that's a very good question, and I'm happy to answer that, uh, that as we go here. Um, in the past, I'll say um, over the, the many hundreds of years, and uh, many... Uh, most of the time we're talking about white wines here. We're not talking about red wines, but um, when white wines are clarified, as in trying to remove the protein um, aspects of a wine that makes it cloudy, uh, there are uh, additives that you add to wine to precipitate out the protein instabilities of that wine. I don't want to get very technical here, but um, you know, in, in, in many of the past years, years and years, you know, traditional um, uh, additives that have been added to the wines have been, you know, have or could have been protein, sorry, um, animal derived. And that's what it would have made them non-vegan friendly. So the wine uh, itself at the end doesn't actually have any animal products in it, but they might have been made using like um, if, if egg any, if, and, yes if any and, if anything have come in contact with a wine that uh, was animal derived you can't call it vegan friendly right. so um, but we've never used any animal derivatives uh, in any of our protein finding um, we've never used egg whites or isinglass which is you know fish you know derivatives any of that stuff that has, uh, has come through our uh, process. So, um, and I'll, 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 I can't speak for all wines around the world. There are very much, you know, old world traditional styles and, and what they'll do to wines. Um, so I do think you, you really need to ask the questions, but uh, for the most part, you know, all of the new technology that's come through over the last kind of 15 years really points towards, you know, there's been no animal derivatives used in any of the wine production. Um, and this also goes back to, you know, your um, uh, food safety and, and um, uh, what's your peanut butter and stuff like that? What's the, uh, what's the term on that? Allergies. Allergies, sorry. So uh, not that anybody using peanut butter in any of the wines, but I'm just talking about allergies. I just, the one thing that sparks my mind. Um, but it's, it's just one of those things that, uh, we don't use any of those animal derivatives in producing any of our wines. Red wines have got protein in them. You're not trying to pull the protein out of it, uh, because you want the color and you want the stability of that color flavor and tannin profile. So for the most part throughout the world, your red wines are going to be fr uh, vegan friendly, 
it's really your wet, your white, white lines that you have to really be, uh, you know, just, just look out for. That's all. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So Chardonnay and the East Dill Summer Rosé. <clears throat> so I, I am cracking open my bottle of my uh, uh, 200 ml East Dill Barrel Fermented Chardonnay. Um, so this, sorry, Barrel Aged Chardonnay. So this is uh, uh, in our Lakeview Cellars tier. Um, we, we produce this in our 200 ml uh, PET bottle, which is uh, very much... Um, um, you know, lightweight, uh, it's also, we produce it primarily for via rail and, you know, for the airline business and things like that, because everybody's moving away from glass. We do very much, uh, very, uh, you know, golf courses and, you know, it's something you can use on when you're on the patio or picnics because you don't want to carry glass around and potential breakage and all those things. So uh, that's why we've moved to this PET bottle. We've developed this mold ourselves um, that is strictly for, you know, our, our process, you won't see anybody else have this mold, um, but it gives it that single serve, uh, you know, uh, airline feel. Most of the airline business actually sells in 187 mil sizing. Uh, here in Ontario, we can't sell in 187, it's gotta be 200 mil. And that's the reason why we developed that specific size and mold. Um, so it is, uh, you know, our Lakeview Seller series is barrel aged. It's a Chardonnay that comes from Two properties in Niagara and Lake, um, and uh, it's basically it's about seventy percent, you know, barrel aged, thirty percent tank aged, um, and the the barrel aged portions for about four months uh, in French oak barrels, just to give it a kick of the American oak, uh, sorry, the French oak, I should say, um, to give it that uh, barrel aged style. And uh, and soften the the uh, the, the character. Uh, fully malolactic fermentation through it, um, and you know, in the sense of the the profile, you're getting at you know just that uh, light oak character. It's not going to be a, a full two by four in your mouth. That's not what we're trying to go for. I, I know years ago the Ontario wine industry was trying to make uh, Chardonnays like California. Uh, where they have these two by fours in your mouth, very heavily oak, but Ontario is, you know, a cool climate region. And um, uh, the oak was overpowering the wine. Uh, so we're, we're more a traditional, you know, lighter oak style, uh, barrel aged French oak uh, that will, um, you know, not overpower the characteristics of the wine. Nice buttery characteristics on the, on the, tape, uh, the, the taste profile. And you can see that coming through the palate as well. I think the one thing that Tom said that's the best part about these, if you are on the golf course, you can hide these in a ball <laughs> sleeve or they do sit in the side pocket very easily. <laughs> Just a pro tip going forward. Yeah, I, well, Mike knows me a lot. I play a lot of golf and I do sneak a few of my own samples on the course. So anyway. How's everybody enjoying it? Okay, I see a thumbs up on that one from Danielle. Yeah, we're getting good feedback. Thank you, everyone. Just put your comments in the chat, please. So we keep the phones and computer lines clear. The one thing I will say is that we produce a number of different styles of uh, Chardonnay, because uh, Chardonnay is actually a very versatile varietal. Um, you can make an un oak style Chardonnay, which is, you know, nice and crisp and refreshing, um, you know, lightly oaked all the way through to a very heavily oaked Chardonnay, depending on, you know, the, the year and the, uh, the character that you're trying to get out of it. Somebody mentioned before that, uh, you know, Thomas McKelder was on, on previous, uh, chats. I mean, he is a, a foremost expert on Chardonnays, um, and, has made some great wines uh, uh, that I've tried anyway. Um, but, you know, Chardonnay is one of those things where you can lightly oak, unoaked, heavily style. It just depends on the, you know, what the taste profile that everybody's looking for. And, you know, it's just a matter of tasting it. Tom, don't they call Chardonnay the winemaker's grape? Because 
it's really the winemaker that determines the style of the Chardonnay as opposed to in the <clears throat> vineyard or many other grapes? You know what? Or has that changed? No, no, no. Well, I'll, I'll say this. Every, every winemaker lives by the same rule. You can't make great wine without starting with great fruit from the vineyard. So um, you got to work very closely with your, your grape growers. You got to make sure that uh, you're getting good fruit into the winery. Now, you get good fruit in the winery, you can still screw up in the winery and make terrible wine. Like, that's going to happen, right? But not, not here, not at Diamond Estates, just so you know. <laughs> but <laughs> um, but uh, certainly terroir, you know, I, I hate to use, you know, I'm not a guy that, you know, spills terroir a lot, but it does signify, you know, the, the, the balance between soil, sunlight, the, the microclimates that come through and how that dictates the you know, the, the wine, the, the grape and the, the uh, quality of the fruit that comes through and even, you know, the flavor profile that comes through in the fruit. So <clears throat> um, Chardonnay, uh, I've heard, you know, the wine industry called Pinot Noir being the, the you know, the one that uh, winemakers say, you know, dictates terroir. But then I've heard Cap Franc, I've heard Riesling. In the end, every grape varietal is going to be responsive to its own terroir. You've just seen that previously with uh, Sauvignon Blanc from New Zealand. It's very highly, you know, uh, strong towards gooseberry uh, character. Uh, here in Ontario, Sauvignon Blanc is very, you know, can be very green or it can be very tropical in character. And um, we have some fantastic soils for Sauvignon Blanc. Chardonnay, for me, is a uh, is is one that can be uh, manipulated a little bit uh, based on the style that you're trying to do because you're going to be having, you know, different oak regimes that you want to do on it. And every winemaker has a different, you know, philosophy on what type of oak to use. You can use Hungarian oak, which primarily we use, um, French oak, um, uh, you know, American oak, that all change the character of that wine. You get more vanilla character versus, you know, lightly oaked and, you know, neutral character. So um, Chardonnay for sure, based on a winemaker's style, uh, can have an influence, you know, the winemaker can have an influence in how they want that to taste to a consumer. Uh, one of the things with our trajectory beverage partners is like, we got to listen to our consumers. If the majority of consumers are, drinking un -oak style wines, there's no point of me producing heavily oak style Chardonnays because the consumers are telling me that this is what they like to see. So, you know, that's where you have to kind of listen to what the market's dictating. And as I mentioned before, 10 years ago, um, you know, Ontario was trying to be what California was and, and make these heavily oaked Chardonnays. Meanwhile, the consumer was saying, we don't really like heavily oak Chardonnays because I'm not drinking it with food all the time. I want to be able to sip it on the patio. So that's where you, you got to be able to adjust your winemaking style to what's, you know, what's in the marketplace. Awesome. And I think, in all fairness, even the Californians have toned down their Chardonnay. I do agree. I do agree with that as well. Yes. Okay. So Lakeview Chardonnay. Awesome. Eastdale Summer Rosé. And this was, this was a surprise to me. I think but a maybe welcome surprise. What, I was... what happened with the Eastdale brand and the, and the rosés in particular. I was fortunate enough to sample this with Tom um, a couple weeks ago. And as soon Let's as I did, I... Up, Mike. Let's not bring that up. It was a light sampling. <laughs> and uh, I was, as soon as I did, uh, Teresa was the first person that I called about bringing on uh, this to the wine club, was I thought this style... Um, we've featured some of these wines before and the change in the style and, and the product is entirely different, I think it would fit perfectly. So uh, I'm setting you up for success here, Tom, take it away. Okay. So Teresa, why were, why would you, why did you say that? I'd like to just understand a little bit back, your okay. little bit of background. So around 2006, uh, seven, eight, whatever, Eastdale, I used to go to Eastdale. Mm -hmm. They had a dry rosé. It was awesome. I bought it all the time. I bought it for several years. And then one year I went out, and I don't know whether it was 2008, 2009, whatever, they turned into sweet rosés. And so I have not tasted an East Dell rosé since that time until Michael 
brought it over. Okay. And I was not, and so when he brought it over, I went, okay, this is very nice. It's like for the club, it's a kit. Um, but I did not have high expectations. Oh, okay. Well, that, that lad's prelude. So now I got a, a, a big hurdle to overcome here to try, you know, but I tasted it. Yes. over the hump. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> yes, I mean, and, and back, it, to this, back to the Chardonnay conversation, you know, back in 2006, 2007, I mean, we, we purchased East Dell Estates in 2005, sorry, 2003. And um, again, our sales team, you know, Mike, uh, you know, people like Mike, I should say, <laughs> um, came to us saying, okay, the market is changing. They're looking for sweeter style rosés. The LCBO was telling us it needs to be sweeter style rosés. Never listen this- to the LCBO. Uh, well, just saying. Yeah, the unfortunate part, Teresa, is they're our biggest customer. I know. So somehow you have to, you know, work with them a little bit, right? But uh, in the end, they're saying, okay, it needs sweeter style, sweeter style. Our marketing team, our sales team said, okay, sweeter style. So we did. We did increase the, the, the you know, the sweetness level of our East Dell Summer Rosé because, again, summer rosé signifies summertime. It's more palatable on the, the, the patio as a, you know, a little sweeter style rather than a dry style. That being said now, um, things have slightly changed over 10 years. And now you see a lot more rosés not being this bright, bright, you know, rosé pink style. It's more gone to this now salmon, I'll call it salmon color, briar style rosé. Teresa, you'll see it in the, in the LCBL. And so, you know, we are adjusting everything we do. We do two different styles of rosé now. We do our summer rosé for Eastdale, but it is toning down on the sweetness level. It's becoming more of a drier style because that's what the consumers are saying. That's what we like. Okay, so we can do those things. Um, We also do a Pinot Noir rosé, which is fantastic. Um, Color body, nicer, yep. Yeah, but again, Pinot Noir versus uh, the East Del Summer Rosé, which is Gamay Riesling based, and I'll, I'll talk about it as we go, is a little bit different in, in profile, and it's got a little bit different balance in the, on the back end versus, you know, Christ, nice crisp and refreshing in the front end for, you know, the Summer Rosé style. So that being said, that's why the style is changing slightly for our East Del Summer Rosé. Again, we do this in a 200 mil size PET again for golf courses and and things and actually it works great for virtual tastings like this instead of having everybody take a 750 mil bottle we can do a nice little tasting with this right uh, and that's where we found a lot of this uh up you know um pickup is when we're doing virtual tasting at these smaller style sizes like the 375 mil moscato sparkling i think is a fantastic size for individual consumption because I personally don't like to open a 750 mil sparkling wine because I can't finish the whole bottle and then the bubbles are gone, right? So 375 mil sparklings are fantastic from, from a you know consumer perception drinking at home. Um, <clears throat> same thing goes with the 200 mil style wines that we're doing uh, for you know individual or golf courses or, or things like that that we're selling through. So. In this case here, you'll see Teresa and everybody that uh, the color of the summer rosé is toned down from that uh, vibrant, you know, uh, uh, pink color to more of a neutral rosé style color. And and with that has also come, you know, the sweetness level is is turned down just to an off dry, which is only about 12 grams per liter residual sugar to it. So again, it's still Gamay and uh, Riesling based. So uh, Gamay is not red wine that we make Gamay and then blend into Riesling. We actually ferment Gamay Noir for about 24 hours on the skins and then press it off right away to get, you know, just that light red color. Uh, and then we're blending in Riesling, which has got that nice acidity base to it. That's giving you that nice crisp, refreshing uh, character, but getting that nice strawberry and, and, and uh, rhubarb character for, uh, for from the game and that's what you're getting from our summer, uh, summer rosé. So what I would say is well done but the ultimate test is your consumers like not the psalms but the the folks that are are drinking it tonight so let us know what you think 
And <clears throat> in terms of the, I'll just interject in terms of the food pairing in case you want to Please. Um, so I first did the, the food pairing with the Chardonnay, but then when the summer rosé came out, I went, oh my goodness, this works so well, I think as well. <laughs> Sorry. Um, roasted beets and so goat cheese and maple walnuts. So we get a Chardonnay, we want walnuts, we want roasted things, we want, and goat cheese is interesting because goat cheese is typically associated with the Sauvignon Blanc, but if you meld it with beets and walnuts and warm it, mm -hmm. I don't know. So we're talking Chardonnay and Rosé here and coming into spring and summer and I don't know. That was my thinking. So let me know whether or not it worked. I think it works very well. So Teresa, you're getting uh, great feedback on the pairings. Thank you everybody for putting that into the chat. They love your beet salad for sure. Um, we uh, folks have a little bit of inventory left on all of the wines that you see, uh, except for the sample size. And we'll get you the pricing on the ones that were included in your kit. We'll get you an email with the smaller size and a full size bottle that'll come out to you within the next couple of days. And we'll definitely put that into our inventory and you can pick that up. Cause these are great wines for coming into spring and summer. Anyway, okay. So those well, are the whites and the rosé. Teresa, I will tell you, the, uh, I'm not a huge fan of beets by any means, but you know what? What you've put together as a sampler, I can actually enjoy that, that beets. That was nice. <laughs> That's what I always love to hear. When somebody says <clears throat> they don't like a particular ingredient, but when it's put in with something and with the right wine that they all of a sudden like it, I love it. Yeah. <clears throat> yes. Okay. And the, the one thing I'll also say about wine and food pairings is that, you know, these are, are things that, you know, most people would recommend you try it, but you may find, as Teresa just said, you try it with something else and say, whoa, that's unusual. I really like that. That's, you know, it's just got a, a new flavor coming out of that that I've never seen before, right? So there's no, there's no wrong answer. Actually, one of the, the dying rules that we live by at the winery, uh, and I'll tell you this every uh, one of the, the, the slogans that we use in, in some of our wines is uh, we're, we're made from snob free grapes. All right. So there's no <laughs> wrong answer. Absolutely. All right. Okay. So, so Teresa, yeah, we'll move to the second flight. You know, the, the, the thing that we did a couple of uh, months ago was move from a Thursday to a Friday. So our meetings are a little bit more relaxed, I think. And so we're ready, heading into the reds just around 8.30, maybe you mm -hmm. want to start us off. A little off. later than we're normal, but hey, is everybody okay? I haven't heard anybody defecting yet. And everyone, okay. I'm, I'm taking all the orders in the background here for uh, the wines. Well, that where's everybody so going? Far. Nothing's open. So you might as well enjoy the rest of the evening with us. Exactly. <laughs> okay, so we have a flight of reds. What are our reds? So I'm very happy with this uh, with this first one, just because it's something fun and different. We we had a bit of a gap in our portfolio with Spain, and uh, we were able to bring this in last year. Um, it's Vina Albili. It's a Reserva. It's 100% Tempranillo. Uh, cool little branding story behind this wine. Vina obviously translates to to winery, and uh, Albili is uh, the brightest star in the constellation of Aquarius which they could see from the vineyard. So that's where the branding of this, of this wine comes from. Uh, it's a Felix Soli wine. Uh, it's located in South Castilla. The interesting growing region because you can get super hot summers of a 40, 50 degree Celsius. Summers, but then minus 10 in the winter. Um, so I, I like to say this is a pretty traditional Spanish wine in terms of the way that it's aged. Uh, it's an American oak for 12 months, and then it's mandatory bottle aging between two and three years per bottle. So like I said, it's not Cristenza, it's not Grand Reserve, it's right in between there at that Reserva stage. Um, please go ahead and taste this first and then we can talk about some of the flavors that, that we smell in the tasting. And Michael, I've seen you 
you put into the chat. If anyone wants to have something, they can have it shipped directly to their home, but we will be placing an order after uh, tonight. We have a little bit in inventory, so we'll figure that out. If someone wants a direct case, uh, Michael can help you out, get it shipped to your house. Uh, if you want something less than that, we'll be ordering as well, and you can pick it up uh, here on Scarlet Crescent. So all good. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so this, this is, is an this is a, this is an awesome tempranillo by me, I, like, you're and especially at the price point. No. Like yeah, I mean you always have to have that conversation about wine. I think uh, the value of it, right? The price point, the quality of the wine, and 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 the way you consume it as well. Um, this for me personally, this is like the kind of style that I of wine that I gravitate towards every day. This would be something I would everyday drinking wine for me. It's fantastic. A lot of cherry, uh, vanilla. I definitely get the oak on here. Um, a little bit of chocolate, some spice. Uh, but what I really love about it is the, the tannin structure. Um, and I think with your with your pairings here, especially with the cheese, uh, this is like that fat to tannin to, to a little bit of the fruit and jam. And this is, is a perfect combo. But um, I'm going to segue right into your to your food pairing here, Teresa. No, no, that's okay. So, so to me, uh, Spanish Tempranillo and this particular one, and by the way, uh, Michael, thank you very much for always dropping off the wines to me no like a month ahead of time so that I can taste them and try and figure out the food pairings. And, yeah, no and that's huge. Um, and not everybody does that. So happy we can we can help you guys out. OK, so the time. So chorizo. So, and I'm thinking Spanish and, um, and it's just such a classic Tempranillo, a Spanish wine. So the chorizo, the manchango, and then um, of course, roasted red peppers. That's the Spanish term, but basically what it is. And I don't know, it's a robust wine, meat, cheese, peppers, roasted, I don't know. Seem to work for me. I agree. This is um, this is kind of a tapas pairing all day, but I love that that cheese with the big red wines and the tannins and the spice and yeah, because the cheese is bold enough. Like the, yeah. the Spanish cheese, so not all cheeses would go with the big red wine, but the Spanish cheese is strong enough that it fits. Um, anyway, sorry, I interrupted you. No, no, it's great. I, it's a, it's a personal favorite of me. So you're not offending anybody except me if you don't like this wine. So I just want you guys to know that. <laughs> um, but I hope you all enjoy this pairing and I hope you all enjoy the wine. Um, it was definitely, like I said, a void in the pro portfolio that we had, but something that I was able to bring in um, and taste with you guys today. So, so we, you know, we, we try to cater to uh, some of our members are, having special kits. And when I get a positive thumbs up from the vegetarian in the room <laughs> at the red wine course, that's always a good sign. So thank you, Michael. Thank you, Teresa, for that. Fantastic. Okay. Do we want to move on? Is it time to move on to the East Dell? East Dell Estates Black Cat. Oh, I'm going to take this. Sorry about that, guys. I had to unmute there while I was chomping down on cheese. So, <laughs> so you will um, need your kit, have you, Tom? Well, I'm I'm partaking in the kit big time here. Um, Excellent. Uh, I actually, to be honest with you, I uh, I went through and I opened the you know the cheddar cheese just to see you know if there was a different character that I could see out of the wine, you know, because I'd like to experiment. I want to see what's going on. Uh, I should say that I'm a huge fan of cheeses and trying different types of cheeses with different types of wines, even though they may not go or may go, it just, it just pulls down different flavors that you may or may not realize that they're, they're there. So, all right. Um, so I did notice in one of the previous, you know, uh, hands up comments that, you know, where can you get some of these wines? Um, so I'll just say this before, uh, I'm sure Mike will share a link to our, uh, uh, online platform. You're more than welcome to order. We have, uh, delivery services. You just gotta, you know, log in, put your information in and 
we'll take care of the rest for you. So um, everything, you don't necessarily need to come down to the winery. We'd love to have you down, but uh, certainly um, if you want to deliver to your door, we can take care of that for you as well. All right. So uh, the next wine that we're trying is our East Dell Estates uh, Black Cab. Now this has been a steadfast uh, staple uh, for East Dell uh, under the East Dell brand since uh, 2003. Uh, it's one of the top selling uh, red wine blends, VQA red wine blends from Ontario. Um, down, nitro, down. Sorry guys, that was my dog. He's seeing all the cheese on top of the, the you know, <laughs> the, the work desk over here. Um, so this wine here is actually a blend of Cabernet Franc, Cabernet uh, Sauvignon. So Cabernet Franc is about 45%. Cabernet Sauvignon is about 25%. And then the balance being Baco Noir. Um, for those who are not familiar with uh, Baco, uh, Baco is one of the grape varieties that started the Ontario wine industry. I used to say 40 years ago, and now it's been about 20 years, so it's about 60 years ago. Um, that uh, uh, you know was more in you know quality winemaking rather than using you know Niagara's and Concords, if that's the the the, the quickest way and dirty way to say it. So. Um, it produces, Bacco Noir produces a very leathery, um, you know, very dark style, slightly more acidic than a traditional Bordeaux varietal um, uh, red wine. Very nice quality. Uh, however, what we found is most consumers, you know, are, you know, because we have such a huge influx of Tempranillos and Bordeaux style wines from around the world, that um, uh, you need to be able to you know blend some sort of Ontario with you know traditional Bordeaux varietals. So um, you know this is where we've come up with Black Cab. Uh, this is not import blended. I'm not talking about that. It's just traditional Cab Sauv and, and Cabernet Franc produced from Ontario. But it's uh, it's blending in uh, Bac Noir from uh, that's produced from Ontario. Very early ripening produces ripe fruit every year, you know, 23 bricks, you know, beginning of September, um, very winter hardy. It's a steadfast for Ontario. It's actually one of the, the fastest growing varietals in Ontario now with, um, uh, with people getting more accustomed to it. But our East El Black Cab, um, again, our Cab Sauv, Cab Franc, aged in Hungarian oak for over 12 months. Baco Noir, we age in American oak because of its very dense character. So we want a lot more vanilla character coming through it. And, uh, and then we take those barrels and we blend them together um, in roughly that percentage that I said to you um, to produce you know, our East El Black Cab. It is a trademark, uh, produces a very nice, easy drinking uh, red wine. And I hope everybody enjoys it. So Teresa, notwithstanding that it's our custom to always end with cheddar cheese and then chocolate, what made you think that this was a good matching? So it's a big, bold red. And cheddar cheese and a big, bold red typically work. And, and the same with the dark chocolates. So, um, and I do them, prog sorry, progressively. So the tapas and the Spanish wine, there, was, um, there were different layers and different textures. The black cab, the baco, and the cab sauvignon um, and cheddar cheese, you, can't, you pretty much can't go wrong. And then when we get to the Zinfandel, it has a little bit more sweetness to it, and it's a dark chocolate, but it's also the biggest, boldest of the reds. So that, to me, goes with the dark chocolate. So, so one of our members has asked, it, she feels like she's getting a floral uh, fragrance from, from the Black Cab is, is, and wants to know if she's weird. <laughs> 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 and we would never say that. <laughs> but Tom, I wonder if you have a comment. 
I've made a point in my entire winemaking career never to criticize anybody's nasal passage and organ uh, organoleptic uh, uh, flavors that they get out of there because you know what? Everybody's different. Mm -hmm. And to be honest with you, I continue to learn every day when I smell new fruit, you know, new foods in the kitchen, new flavors. I mean, every vintage is different for us, right? And I find, whoa, what's going on over here? Because um, I've never smelled that before. So, and then I find it very, oh, I like that. Or uh, how do we, how do we do that again? Type thing, you know what I mean? So I'll never, uh, never criticize anybody for what they're smelling. Uh, the one thing, you know, I, I try to explain this to uh, one of our staff earlier today. It's like, the one thing I'll tell you is, first of all, you should be able to say, is this wine a good wine or is it not a good wine? Start with that. Simple terms. Yes, it's a good wine or there's flaws. How's that? And then once you say, okay, it's a good wine, it's a bad wine. Okay, start from the good wine. Let's say, okay, now what kind of characters do you get out of it? You know, sights, you know, smells, uh, and then trying to hone down and those kind of things. So, um, and as we go through these tastings, I don't know, uh, you know, how many glasses of uh, are in front of everybody, but, you know, certainly if you've got different wines in front of you and you go from one glass to another glass and you, you if you may have the Sauvignon Blanc on the left-hand side and you quickly smell that and then you all of a sudden taste the, the black cab right next to it, you still may have some flavors or, or profiles in your nasal cavity that are, you know, maybe giving you some reference to something previous, right? So um, it, it, those are just little things that you you may or may not, you know, you know realize. Um, certainly from a backo standpoint, it's it's definitely got some, you know, you know, dark fruit and leather characteristics, um, uh, you know, you, you may get some hints, you know, obviously with the barrel char characteristics so you're getting through there. Um, but there's, there's no wrong answer to anything you're, you're going to get. That's what and I'm saying. Actually, Tom, if I could interject for a second. Yeah. So you made a very, very good point. When you're going from wine to wine, you're tasting the, the residual tastes of the previous wine. So it really does take at least two sips of your next wine in order to truly taste that wine. So the first sip is really just gonna cleanse your palate or uh, change your palate. And then the next sip is going to um, allow you to taste mm -hmm. it. So very, very good point. Thanks. Uh, yeah, so the first two reds, we're getting a lot of positive comments. Thank you very much uh, from Heather Menchego with the Reserva, you know, the tapas, who, who wouldn't want tapas on a Friday night in Canada in March? That's, that's fantastic. And of course, the cheddar cheese with the black cab. Uh, wondering if it's time, Teresa, to move on to the last pairing? Absolutely. Yeah, can I, can I just ask a quick question with your, your tasting panel here? Um, uh, your group. Um, obviously, you've seen some wines here that are in screw cap, and then you've obviously had the uh, uh, Reserve Albani Alban in cork. I'm just curious to know what everybody's feelings are with cork versus screw cap. Oh, very interesting question. Uh, like, and it's a I can answer this question, question all night. I can answer so, this. Yeah. I can answer this to. Yeah, I can answer this all night, but I just wanted to hear what everybody's opinion is, right? All right. No, and nobody and has the answer, what? I'm just curious. Actually, great question. And so folks, like, write in, do you prefer screw cap or cork or combination of, um, like, and so, it's, a, it's an interesting discussion in my household because of course I'm a Psalm, I like cork and I, anyway. And, but we drink wine, uh, like everyday wines, and my husband's going, oh my goodness, why can't everything be with screw cap? <laughs> well, so uh, I'll tell you, I, I've got so used to screw cap that when I have to go find a core screw, which I had to do with the, the old Bali, yep. I'm like, I can't even find a core screw anymore. What's going on? <laughs> I know. But I don't know, there's something to be said for corks and corks and bottles. Anyway, so 
totally interested in great question. Great, yeah, great feedback. In what people were going to put in. I, I don't want to layer in the next question is whether you know somebody wants um, uh, natural cork versus synthetic. Oh, cork. Tom, <laughs> never synthetic. <laughs> So oh, I'm going to stop you at the past there. <laughs> Never synthetic. So, well, mm -hmm. sometimes you'd be hard pressed to find the difference now with the, the technology, just before, just so you know. But anyway. Mm, doesn't go back in the bottle the same way. It's not meant to go back in the bottle. You're supposed to drink the whole bottle. Well, there you go. And with synthetic <laughs> pork, you typically cannot put it back in the bottle. So... All right. Anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll on that note, that. We'll, we'll thanks, Tom. We'll we're defer that discussion. <laughs> so I, I feel like this is our a, a throwback to my family when my grandmother used to say at Thanksgiving, why can't we all just get along? Everyone has their yeah. own opinion. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I'm exactly. seeing a 50-50 split. I think it depends on the wine. I think it depends on the occasion. If you're going somewhere, you don't have a corkscrew. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, so I think there's a place for all, but but thanks for raising that because mm -hmm. it'll be a never ending discussion. So maybe we'll move on to the third pairing. I hear you. <laughs> sure. Okay. Um, so we have our 2014 Grace Bridge Zinn. It's out of Lodi, California. I don't know how it came to this conclusion, uh, but the bridge is a photo of a bridge that spanned the Cooper River in Charleston, South Carolina. We had some South Carolina <laughs> brand that's made in Lodi, California. Um, the, the motto of this wine is the bridge is too good to taste. So uh, basically this was designed to be a kind of an everyday, just above a, let's say a more premium tier, uh, more premium tier uh, as in Fidelity to Lodi, California, uh, but kind of your everyday enjoyment wine, sitting around with the family and enjoying a meal. And that was the design behind this wine uh, in the cell. Um, on the nose, like Teresa said, make sure you sa sample this one twice uh, to get any to get rid of any of the residual wines beforehand. Uh, but drinking wine more than once is always a great idea. I think, in my class. I think we've gotten to that, that point in the tasting where this is almost like the dessert of what we had. At any time you can have that big red wine with a dark chocolate combination, it's great. Uh, especially the two big notes that I get out of this, it's, it's Kern's Blackberry. So um, that's it for me on, on this wine. If, if there's anybody else, that gets something different, please type in comments, let me know. Uh, but this is, I find it actually quite smooth. I'm gonna taste it again with you guys, but let me know what you think. Definitely a smooth, almost understated Zinfandel. Mm -hmm. Like good, like understated doesn't mean bad, but no. it's not the big, bold, over the top Zinfandel than no. you can get sometimes. Yeah, the so, yeah I would I would say yeah. California Zins have become most well known as being super fruit forward, a little bit more residual sugar than a lot of spice and oak on the back end. So it's almost like this mix of of opposite ends on that on the spectrum yeah. of, of the wine it's scale a, here. It's, it's a reserved, graceful Zinfandel. Yeah, I, I I would agree with you. And I think it's something because I'll use your word understated, but something that's smooth and, and subtle and easy to drink. I think every day, um, if you were to open this up, I think it goes down very, very smooth, but it does have the weight behind it and the fruit on the front of it, I think goes very well with the dark chocolate. Okay. Is this, uh, is everybody, you've tasted three very different wines on the red flight side. So is everybody mm -hmm. picking this one up or is it red wine at this point? Uh, maybe you could comment on uh, Beth and Martin are saying never had a seven-year-old Zinfandel before. Is that an unusual aging? Um, um, no, you can, I mean, going back, and Tom can interject here too, but depending on the fruit yeah. that you start with, if it's an old vine Zin, if it's a new vine, like depending where you're, you're curating your fruit from to begin with. Um, and really the, the vintage can have a lot, a large part to play, play with it. If it's a high alcohol, heavy body wine that will withstand that time of aging, you can definitely do it. I would say to the seven-year-olds in question uh, straight up uh, on consumer drinking habits right now, they're gravitating towards drink nows and pindels, which are a lot younger, uh, less aged and just heavy fruit up front. Um, that would be more of the consumer inside aspect of things that we're seeing in the market. So from my perspective, 
Um, listen, I'll, I'll tell you everybody right now that I am a huge fan of very powerful uh, uh, wines. Uh, I'm originally from South Africa, so South African Pinotage, very powerful, you know, pungent wines, as in and pungent not being, you know, bad flavor, but just very spicy and very full character um, is something that I look forward to. So Zinfandel is one of my favorite varieties. If we could grow Zinfandel in Ontario, I would be producing a Zinfandel, but unfortunately Zinfandel is uh, cold sensitive to minus 12 degrees Celsius, and we routinely get colder than minus 12 here in Ontario. So all of the primary buds in, you know, in Zinfandel would die. Um, that's why you don't see any Zinfandels in Ontario, those of you would do it. Um, Zinfandel, you know, I, I've looked at this bottle, uh, Grace, Grace Bridge. Uh, it doesn't really specify where, what region it comes from, whether it's Lodi or it's uh, uh, Napa or things like that. Um, it, it does have great character for Zinfandel. It's more of a medium bodied Zin. I mean, Zinfandel is a very flexible varietal. You can produce a, you know, white Zin, which is, you know, a light rosé style, all the way through to a very, very full pungent, you know, beautiful Zin, right? And I, I'm a huge fan of those too. So, um, but, you know, this one's a great, you know, great flavor, but it's a medium bodied wine, Not nothing wrong with it. Uh, my personal opinion is with dark chocolate, and this is just my opinion. Again, there's no wrong answer here, but I think the dark chocolate takes a little bit away. It makes the, the wine taste a little bit thinner than what it is uh, if you just taste the wine by itself. And I, I tasted the wine before. I thought it was great. Then I tasted the dark chocolate and then tasted the back of the wine. And it was almost like it was a little thinner than it was before the dark chocolate. So that, that, that's just my opinion on that as, aspect of the uh, tasting. Now I did taste it with the cheese and uh, sorry, I'm just going back to the, the chorizo and I thought, Ooh, this tastes really good. You know, so different things. So my question to you would be, could I, or should I have switched the cheddar cheese and dark chocolate, like the two wines with the cheddar cheese and dark chocolate, would you have been happier with East Dell Estates Black Cab with the dark chocolate? And the Zinfandel with the cheddar cheese. Well, I tasted both the same way. Like I, I, I've tasted wines with different things that you've paired it with, which is great. Because again, you know, there's no wrong answer. I taste them just to see if I get different characters. And like I enjoyed the Chirozo with the East El Black Cab, and I enjoyed the Albany Reserve with the cheddar cheese, just because of the different flavors that were coming through and the and. Also with the cheese, there's different milkiness, right? I mean, the cheddar was a little, it, it had a lot, lot more, you know, it was a stronger flavor where the, you know, chorizo was a, a little softer in the character, right? So it was just different. Okay. But we did that. Always, Teresa, always good to get feedback. Pardon? We did that, Teresa, in the before time. In the before time, you would always say, save a little bit from yeah. each... Yes. To, to go into absolutely eat, to in eat. fact in an ideal world you taste all three of the things with all three of the wines agreed yeah yeah but again i mean they all tasted great i just found with the dark, dark chocolate with uh you know the grace bridge um the dark chocolate was very strong which when i obviously tasted the you know the the Zinfandel afterwards was just a little bit thinner in, in character and you wanted to make sure it enhanced the flavor. It just felt a little bit thinner on it, right? So that's, that was my opinion. Yeah, because it wasn't a huge Zin. No, exactly. And that's that's yeah. what I'm trying. But from a Zinfandel standpoint that, you know, what price is it, Mike? Uh, 17 49 Right. I mean, it's an easy, it's an easy drinking Zin that, uh, you know, you, you, you know, for a great profile that at seventeen ninety five, it's not 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 an issue. So yeah. Um, okay. Sorry, we're getting it's getting a wee bit late here. So okay. So, can I just say, Tom, you have fans. Okay. I I want to give a shout out, Paula okay. and Glenn. Uh, say thank you, and they miss you. So they'll reach out to you directly for their reveal of who they are. But thank you, everyone, for your comments. Everyone seems <laughs> to be loving the the pairings and it's such a pleasure to have the winemaker with us thank you so much tom mm -hmm. and there's yep. been lots and lots of comments i think mike michael and uh, you may be even seeing those and 
and it's really been fantastic. So maybe Teresa, you'll wrap us up. Yep. So my thank yous as well. So Michael, welcome back. Always love to have you here. Feels good to be back. <laughs> Tom, thank you very much for joining in. You're welcome. Like you just added so much. It was perfect. And Marilyn, of course, she's been on the call, but she's, yeah, just kind of a right-hand person all around. The food and wine kids. So, you know, the team is awesome. So Dorothy, <laughs> Lorraine, Carl, Anne, Marilyn, everybody that, um, and especially in these times. So Dorothy arrived in the morning and helped do this and Lorraine and was in the afternoon and Carl and Ann the next day and everybody's got masks on and everybody's like it's it's a a very different environment that we're working in um but it takes a huge team to do this wine buyers let us know if you want more wines we have a few left over from the wines that we pre-ordered um, and then, of course, all the wines are available by the case. And Michael, you're going to send me the prices of yep. the full bottled wines. Correct. Uh, of the samples. Definitely. And the rosés, people. Oh, that's a perfect summer wine. <laughs> yep. Coming up, Spring Fling, April 10th, Chef Maggie. Um, if you haven't signed up, please do. May 28th, Carlo Estates Gourmet Vegan. If you have vegan or vegetarian friends, let them know about this event because it's, it's not just about the wines, which I'm hearing are more and more vegan these days, but it's also the food. So we're gonna do, we're gonna try for a gourmet plant-based uh, menu. And May 16th, our first live event. So anybody that wants to go to this, that's on this call, you have first dibs. Let me know, I'll sign you up. Or when we go live, uh, you have 48 hours to do it. Am I included in this? I'm just curious. <laughs> oh, <laughs> okay. Our first <laughs> registration. <laughs> first registration. <laughs> Tom, we can carpool. I'll pick you up. It'll be fun. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anybody else? Any comments? Any, like, go back to socialization? Or, like, well, the only thing I'll say is uh, I want to thank everybody for, you know, allowing me to be on the call and, you know, talk about a little bit of our wines, including our, our agency brands. Um, if there's any other information that you would like, please feel free to either email myself or Mike German. Um, my email address uh, will be shared. Mike will share it with you, but it's okay. tgreen at diamondwines.com. If you got any questions, I am, you can obviously we see we spent two hours tonight instead of, uh, you know, whatever your normal time is, but I love sharing information with everybody. So if you have any questions, awesome. please feel free to email me and I'm happy to discuss with you. And if you have any ideas for us or want to send some comments back, please nope. go for it. Good. Totally open suggestions. So, Teresa. And this is a great group of people, I have to say. Teresa, if you could stop yep. sharing your screen and that will give us back oh, the okay. gallery mode. It's been our custom yes. for those who wish to participate. Yeah, for, hold on. I just need to change my view to gallery. So... Yep. You know, uh, hoist them if you have them. Hold on, I'm just going to close this. Hoist it if you have it. I'm going to give you a countdown. <laughs> if you want to so be give, on. Give Dave 10 seconds to run back up to his station. <laughs> oh, 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 okay. <laughs> so everyone, if you, I'm going to give you a countdown in five and uh, so get your glasses and raise them and say cheers. Uh, so that'll happen in five, four, three, Two and one. We're going to say cheers. Cheers, cheers, everyone. Cheers. cheers. Thank you for that. Awesome. Happy Friday. Thank you. I assume Thank that you. was the screen shot, right? That was good. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Take care, everyone. We'll see you soon. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Thanks, Michael. Thank you.
Thanks, Thanks guys. Tom. Thank you, Tom. That was awesome.